So we're going to talk about psychology of performance management, or really uh, neuropsychology of performance management, because the fields of neuroscience and psychology are diverge, uh, sorry, converging very quickly um, through really our, our, our better ability and our, our better ability to uh, to make instruments to look inside a human mind while it's working. If you think 20 or 30 years ago, all we could do was dissect a brain. It didn't really tell us much. But then just in the last 10 or 20 years, we've been able to put people in these real-time scanners and watch what their brains do while they're working. So there was a famous experiment where we put taxi drivers in an MRI scanner to see which part of their brain became active when they're calculating a route and uh, which part brain became active when they're figuring out you know, which long route to take so they can charge a bit more and stuff like that. Um, which part of the brain becomes active when they're telling you who they had in the back of their cab recently. Um, but we're able to do this because we have advances in technology that we, we didn't have 30 or 40 years ago. So a lot of really fascinating stuff that was done historically in terms of uh, psychology experiments was done kind of by guesswork and inference and, and devising some uh, really quite neat experiments to try and rule out different factors and figure out what's going on. But pretty much, for the most part, treated the, the mind as a black box. We don't really know what's going on inside it. We know what comes in, we know what goes out, but we don't know how it works. And that's changing uh, through the convergence of neuroscience and, and psychology. Uh, start with the, the gospel. The CIPD definition of performance management. Uh, the activity and set of processes that aim to maintain and improve employee performance in line with an organization's objectives. And the, the important bit I want to draw your attention to there is in line with. may seem kind of innocuous. Uh, it's important because often we think of performance management. It's easy to think of it in terms of just getting people to work harder and faster and longer and better. And that's not the case because an organization and the market that exists within are, are a system. It's a, and within a system, the parts depend on each other. So actually, we can't have a part of a system that's performing uh, at a much uh, you know, higher rate or a much higher output than other parts. It puts the system out of balance. So actually, performance management is really about getting people to perform in a way that's in line with, that's aligned with the context that people are working within. And that's very important. We're not just asking people to do more. We're asking people to work in a way and, and at a, a level of output that's right and that's appropriate for the way that we've designed the organization, the way that we've designed the strategy and the processes and how all the different parts fit together. Um, oh, before I do that. Go back. There we go. Uh, would anybody like to hazard a guess at how old the practice of performance management is? Tudor times. Tudor times. When, what year is that? I don't know. <laughs> 1500s. Uh, could you pass me the, um, one of those pens, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Tudor times, which is what, 1500s? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. 1485. 14, any advance on 1485? Anybody else want to hazard a guess at when? Formal performance management, rating people's performance, documenting it, using it in performance reviews. I accidentally showed you, I'd like to point out. <laughs> it's when, sorry? Two and a half thousand years ago. So... Year zero. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good guess. I knew I should have put a blank slide in there. Uh, so uh, the emperors, around about 220 to 260 AD, is the earliest recorded uh, example I can find of formal performance management as we know it today. And the emperors of the Wee dynasty would rate the performance of their official um, family members. <laughs> <clears throat> the philosopher, Sin Yu, wrote that the, um, the imperial rater of nine grades, that would be a great job title, wouldn't it? Uh, the imperial rater of nine grades seldom rates men according to their merits, but always according to his liking. So recorded performance management, a couple of thousand years old, rater bias is, is the same age. 
So let's fast forward to the 1920s. I guess you're all familiar with the phrase the Hawthorne effect, which, which says what? What is the Hawthorne effect? If you watch it, it will change. Any, any advance on that? People think they're being studied, then productivity increases. And do we know why? That's the official line, yes. Uh, so the late 1920s, Elton Mayo went along to the uh, Western Electric's Hawthorne Works to figure out how to get people to increase their productivity. What they found, that when people knew that somebody was there watching their productivity, anything that they did increased performance. They turned the lights up and the performance went up. The turned the lights down, performance went up. And what they figured out, or what they, they theorized, is it's the fact that someone was actually concerned about their workplace. Um, but I suppose the flip side of that coin that we get um, is that what gets measured gets done. And if we watch what somebody's doing, they will maybe be more attentive or more aware that they're being observed, being measured, that sort of thing. The late 1950s, oh, random point, late 1950s, we've got uh, the rise of behaviorism. People like B.F. Skinner doing crazy experiments that would be ethically not allowed now, uh, and in fact are not allowed now, electrocuting people, or at least pretending to electrocute people, and stuff like that, and uh, putting pigeons inside self-guided bombs and stuff like that. Um, but what we had is benchmarking, and the, the idea of the, the time and motion man if you're familiar with that concept. So a guy would go to a factory with a, a clipboard and a, a stopwatch and time how long it took people to do certain tasks. And from that, they created this concept that there is a, an average or there's, a, there's an optimum time that it takes to, to perform a certain manufacturing process. And therefore, we can, we can compare people. We can actually start to quantify what we mean by uh, high or at least average performance. Round about the same time, would you believe, ESSO created the 360-degree review. They called it the T-group, but it's basically the 360 review as we know it today. <coughs> Anybody recognize this fella? No? In the 1980s, this is uh, the General, Ex uh, General Electric CEO, Jack Welsh. And he introduced a system that became known as, known as Rank and Yank. Has anybody heard of this? What, what, what happened? Anybody know? I'm glad you said that, because that's the common misconception. What he did was got managers to, uh, to rate employees' performance on a yearly basis and assign them to a scale. So the top 20% of performers were rated as a 1, the middle 70% were rated as a 2, and the bottom 10% were rated as a 3. <coughs> now, it wasn't true that they routinely then fired all bottom 10% uh, bottom rated as a 3, but... If they were layoffs or redundancies, then it was the bottom 10% that went. This rep represented a really fundamental change in the relationship between the employer and the employee. Up until that point, most organizations and perhaps unionization had a, a lot to do with it, would generally work on a last in first out basis. So retention and job security was linked to loyalty. Now for the first time, Retention and job security is linked to performance. The other thing that happened in 1980s was we started getting appraisals. Uh, anybody remember when you had your first appraisal? I'd say mine was 1988. Anybody, anybody earlier than that? Anybody remember? That seem about right? So we've got appraisals and performance-related pay. Now, the idea is very simple. If you think back in the factories from probably 1920s, 30s, 40s onwards, we have this concept of piecework. Uh, do any of you work in an organization where you pay people on a piecework basis? It's very simple. You've got people working on a production line, making widgets. They get paid a set amount for every widget they make. If they want to earn more money, they make more widgets. Simple as that. And if I make 10 and you make 20, you get paid twice as much as me. But it's fair, because everyone knows what they've been measured on. The problem with performance-related pay 
is two things. Firstly, the idea as it was introduced sounded great. We're going to measure your performance, going to give you an annual appraisal, and then we're going to give you a pay rise based on your performance. But what often happened was the opposite. The company had already decided what the budget for pay rises was going to be, and therefore had already decided what people's pay rises were going to be, and therefore reversed back from the pay rise to decide what your appraisal rating should be. And I remember having a, a conversation with my manager uh, when I worked for British Telecom back 20 years ago, um, that, uh, yeah, I don't disagree with the rating you've given yourself because they got us to write our own appraisals. But the pay rise has already been dis uh, dis decided, so um, I'm going to have to downgrade you, you know, one point in order to, for your appraisal to match your pay rise. But at least he was honest about it. Uh, and it's a bit like peace, peace work for all seems like the, the philosophy behind it, but the problem is, how do you evaluate what you can't count? If you've got somebody in a factory making widgets or shoes or plastic cups or God knows what, you can count them, you can count their productivity, but how do we measure your productivity? I mean, for example, who, who here is a, an HR manager or an HR advisor? How do, we measure, how do we measure you and how do we compare you to, to a colleague with the same job title? And that's the fundamental problem. So I'm sure you've all had an appraisal off this guy. <laughs> I certainly have had a few. <clears throat> so where we are today is it's, uh, it's kind of fashionable for companies to say, oh, we're getting rid of annual reviews. We're getting rid of performance reviews. We're getting rid of appraisals. We're not going to do appraisals anymore. Um, we're going to do ongoing performance management. And a lot of companies are saying this, companies like IBM, Dell, Deloitte, Adobe, even General Electric are getting rid of the annual performance review. And what they're saying is they're moving to an ongoing cycle of setting goals and review and reward. <clears throat> but in terms of the psychology of performance that you're here to, to hear about, actually nothing's really changed. In the 2,000 years, since the emperors of the Wee dynasty were rating their, the, had the, uh, what was his name, the, the imperial rater of the nine grades, um, we're still biased, uh, we're still goal-oriented, um, we still focus on what we get rewarded for, and all of this comes about because our brains are connecting machines. So, you all know about DNA, there was even a guy on the radio talking about DNA, saying Miles Davis was in his DNA, unless it's your father, it's unlikely. Um, this is a map of the connections in a, in a human brain, and you're, we kind of define who you are in three ways. The first is with your genome, so you know what your genome is? Anybody? Have anybody heard of the Human Genome product, uh, Project? So your genome is your DNA. It's a sequence of uh, codes that are literally the instructions to build you. So if we could decode what that DNA string meant, we could somehow build a copy of you. But it wouldn't be an exact copy. Has anybody here got an identical twin? No? So even identical twins are not identical. Because the process of going from the code, the genome, to the physical you isn't perfect. There are mistakes. And also, it's dependent on how well you were fed as a child and what your mother fed when, uh, at when you were in the womb. Uh, because that's the physical stuff that you are made of. You are made physically of everything you've ever eaten. So your phenome, yeah, which of course, looking at you, is all, you know, it's all lettuce and salad and... Uh, <laughs> healthy stuff and all that. Um, so your phenome, that's the, the, the physical you. That's the description of the physical you. Your hair colour, your height, your eye colour, um, body shape and all these sorts of things. So the genome tells us how the genome, how those instructions are interpreted to make you. And as I say, that's not a perfect process. So identical twins are not identical there'll be little differences between them because the instructions don't get interpreted perfectly. And then there's one more thing. What the phenome creates is a blank canvas 
on that blank canvas gets overlaid a lifetime of experiences that make you who you are. And that's called your connectome. So the connectome is how your nervous system is wired up. And part of that happened during your development and, and before your birth. But almost everything that's in your brain and nervous system that's physically wired up is a result of a lifetime of experiences. And those lifetime of experiences that you've had so far create the template for the experiences that you are yet to have. So every experience that you have is subjectively colored by the experience that came before it. And that's why we're biased as, as, uh, as, as um, individuals and as, as appraisal raters. So the connectome is your life's experience is built on top of that physical structure. Some interesting things that uh, we've done in the last few years. Scientists have electronically inserted memories into the brains of mice. So they've taken physical memories from one mouse brain, transplanted them into another, and the second mouse could remember things that the first mouse had experienced. Scientists have put a worm's brain into a robot. So they dissected a worm's brain, 340 neurons. A neuron is like a, like a connection or a, a, a circuit. It's what your brain is, is made of fundamentally. So they dissected a worm's brain, 340 neurons, and they, without trying to figure out what the worm did, what these neurons' function was, they just copied them. Without trying to work them out, they just copied them into software. And what they said was, the connectome of the worm, so there's the connectome, the worm's life experiences, was mapped and implemented as a software system and the behaviours emerge. So without trying to figure out what the worm knew or why it was doing what it was doing, they just copied its programming, put that into a robot, and the robot exhibited the same behaviour as the worm. Now that's 340 neurons, you've got about 90 billion. So clearly there's a, a big difference in scale. However, what that tells us is taking the life experiences of a person and transferring those into a software system or potentially another person is not a matter of technology, it's a matter of time. Mapping the human genome, figuring out what all of these DNA sequences do, was unthinkable when DNA was, uh, was first discovered by um, Watson and Crick or Francis and Crick. Let's get those two mixed up. Um, however, it's been done. There was a thing called the Human Genome Project where DNA labs all the way around the world took bits of the DNA sequence to try and figure out what it is that it does. Which bit gives you blue eyes or green eyes? Which bit determines your hair colour or your height or your sex or whatever? Um, and based on that, what we now have is a gene editing therapy where they'll put a, a gene, a human gene, into a virus and the virus will infect you and they've done things like restoring sight in people that have been blind since birth because of a genetic defect. So we're now editing the genome. We've been editing the phenome for decades. I mean, that's plastic surgery. But now we're talking about editing the connectome, your life's experiences that make you who you are. Anybody recognize this guy? Yeah, Ivan, who said that? <laughs> Ivan Pavlov, and what's he famous for? Uh, the, dogs. the dogs. Yeah, in particular, something called stimulus response. So he's the guy that rang the bell. Uh, or probably more accurately, he was the guy that was trained by some dogs to ring a bell when they wanted feeding. <laughs> um, what this tells us, or what we, we know in terms of the way that the brain works and the way that our life experiences build the connectome, is that sensory inputs will spontaneously connect to motor outputs. Uh, the brain is, is, is designed, it's built for learning, that's just what it does. So when two things happen at the same time, the brain will connect them together. If that connection turns out to be not useful, that will get forgotten. But if it's reinforced because it's useful, that connection will persist. So the inputs will spontaneously connect themselves with no, no other intervention to 
physical motor actions, outputs, if the timing is right. The phenomena uh, that's been studied is called spike timing dependent plasticity. What that means is when nerve impulses switch on within a certain time frame, within a certain time window of each other, the brain will change its physical structure. This isn't just like a bit of software in a computer memory. This is the physical structure of the brain. And remember that physical structure is the template for all the experiences that will follow. And this was determined 35 years ago. So this is not, this is not new stuff. But as I say, that convergence of neuroscience and psychology is helping us to, to figure out what to do about it. You know, up, up until we're able to connect this with psychology, then what do we do? Open up somebody's head and rewire something because, uh, you know, because of what they're doing at work or whatever. It's, it's, what do you do with it? That's what we really want to know. That's a neuron. Uh, so basically it has lots of inputs and generally a smaller number of outputs. And they're connected together in a very complex web and that web, the, in the way in which they're connected, goes from sensory inputs, so your eyes, ears, skin, all the different senses that you have, 22 at least senses that you have, totally separate sensory systems, connecting ultimately through to your muscles, which then do things for you, like get in the car and drive to the Trident Center and sit and listen to a presentation and get yourself a sandwich and a cup of tea and so on. You, you, your muscles physically do things, take you places, make things happen in your life. They change the world. And the way all of this is wired up, if we just look at the wiring, the way that those scientists looked at the wiring of that worm's brain, what we see is that the brain is physically structured, well the whole nervous system is physically structured as something called a servo control mechanism. Anybody know what one of those is? Okay. Uh, no engineers in the room then. No. So brain and nervous system are a servo mechanism and it's an autonomous goal-seeking system. Um, I guarantee that you have all interacted with a servo mechanism at least once today. Did anybody use sat-nav on the way here? Did anybody put aircon on in their car or in their office or uh, put the central heating on at home or anything like that? A servo mechanism is capable of great accuracy using very simple, very crude components. <clears throat> All the servo mechanism needs is an outcome, so what's the end state we want it to get to, feedback to let it know if it's reached that end state, and some kind of motor output so that it can, it can change, it can vary its output. That's all it needs. And using just those elements, it will achieve great accuracy and a great precision in getting to some end result. And that's how we are physically wired up. Ah, what's next? As an example, uh, oh, so it basically asks a simple question. Are we there yet? All a servo mechanism does is it varies its output and asks, are we there yet? Seems so simple. That's all it's doing. Uh, there's a couple of examples of, of components of a servo mechanism. So I'm sure you've all got those on your wall at home. There's one here as well. Uh, and all it's doing is we set a target temperature and the system will self-regulate. And it will self-regulate with great precision. If, this can, uh, if we can program it within plus or minus a degree, it will maintain the temperature of the room, plus or minus a degree. And it will do that all by itself, no matter how hot or cold it is outside. Here's another example of a servo mechanism. So back in the 1950s, you could buy a magazine called Popular Electronics, and you could build stuff on your kitchen table. This is an example of a servo mechanism, a self-steering boat, an autopilot for a toy boat. What it does is, it has a little kind of a flap at the front, that detects which direction the boat is going. It sends a signal back down some wires to a motor that controls the rudder at the back. That's all it does. So you set a course, and the boat will follow that course regardless of what happens, regardless of whether wind or tide or currents or somebody pushes it or another boat knocks it. It will maintain that course, and it will do that all by itself using extremely simple components. And this was in the April 1959 edition of Popular Electronics. One of the other features, all about Russian jamming. 
So nothing's really changed there. Uh, so the way a servo mechanism works is it's a constant cycle, constant feedback loop of making a decision, taking action. That action creates some effect in the outside world. And that effect is then detected and fed back into the system through some kind of perception mechanism. Uh, so this cycle of making a decision based on some outcome, something that you want to achieve, or the temperature that we've set the aircon to, then takes an action in order to achieve that goal. That action has some effect in the outside world, and then we're able to detect, are we there yet? And then that feeds back in, and this is a constant, constant ongoing cycle. Um, for any of you with, uh, with L&D experience, does that remind you of anything? Kolb's experiential learning theory, which I think actually isn't a learning theory, it's a living theory. Because what it describes very nicely is every moment of our lives since before we're born, where we try something, something happens in the world, we receive information about what the state of the world is, we figure out what to do next, and so on. This isn't something that only happens when we put people on training courses. This is happening every moment of your life because every experience that you've had becomes a template for every experience that you will have. <clears throat> when we switch a servo mechanism on or we give it a goal, an outcome that we want it to achieve, when we give a servo mechanism a goal to get to, it, will, it doesn't head straight towards the goal because remember it's made from very simple very crude components. It doesn't have that degree of control. But as it gets towards its uh, desired output, its goal, it, it's, it's, its swings, its movements will become more refined. So I'm going to show you a video now. So this is a, a very short video. It's from uh, an American robotics company called Boston Dynamics. And what they specialize in is making robots that can walk. So they've got a four-legged version, they've got two-legged versions. And these things, um, anybody seen that, that Honda robot? It's been on the TV quite a bit on QI and so on. It can walk because it has huge feet and it's programmed to stay upright, but it can only walk if the programmers have seen the room that it's going to be walking in and they've programmed it step by step. What Boston Dynamics are doing is creating autonomous systems that can go anywhere that a human can. What you're going to see is a robot called Big Dog. And what Big Dog is going to do is somebody's going to try and kick it over and you're going to see it correct itself and stand up. It's very quick, so pay attention because what's going to happen is you'll see these big swings, these big overcorrecting steps, and then very quickly its movements become more and more refined until it's back in what in a sober mechanism we call a steady state. Oh, interesting comment. So what it's able to do is walk on this uneven ground, avoiding obstacles, avoiding rocks. It can even run. And it can do that because it's making decisions for itself. It hasn't been programmed in advance to do those movements. It's been given a place to get to, and it figures out how to get there. And if something pushes it off course, it figures out how to correct for that. And because it's able to make those decisions itself, it can correct before it falls over. So what's important to a servo mechanism? And remember, when I say servo mechanism, I don't just mean the aircon, I also mean us. The quality of feedback is not important. Warmer, colder is absolutely fine. What's important is the time delay between the decision and the feedback and the autonomy of the decision maker. These robots are not remote controlled toys. There isn't a human watching and correcting. The robots are figuring things out for themselves because a human can't react fast enough to do what these robots are doing. <coughs> if we put this into the language of performance management, don't tell people what to do. Tell them the deviation from course. So the output is 
23 degrees. Currently, the temperature of the room is 25 degrees. They will know what to do about it. So we point out the difference between the expected output and the actual output. The closer they get to achieving that goal, the better their adjustments will be. I'll, and I'll uh, make these uh, slides available for you as well afterwards. And they will become more accurate over time because every experience that they have of learning and adapting will make them faster and better at doing it next time. So the more autonomy we give people, the faster they get at self-correcting and most important, like any servo mechanism, self-regulating. Which is ideal for managers, I guess. Managers you know, want people to be self-regulating. And actually, for us as individuals to be self-regulating, that's what we call what? Homeostasis, yes, which is the, the steady state of the, uh, of the, uh, the system. But what, what's, how would you describe the feeling of having the autonomy to be self-regulating? Em empowered? What, anything else? Engaged, yeah. It, uh, all these things that we want and we try and get, uh, you know, from uh, from employees and and so on. We we can't get it by by doing the thinking for them. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, it's an exercise I do on uh, often on management training, and um, I won't get you all to practice it because we've got a lot of people and you know it will take all night. But I'll give you a quick demonstration of how it works. So I have here a, uh, a task and a goal, a target. Uh, can I have somebody to help me with a demonstration, please? Thank you very much. What's your name? Joe. Joe. Nice to meet you, Joe. Thank you. So here's your target. Pop that down there for you. If you could come over here. That'll do. And face that way. <laughs> uh, in fact, turn around, first of all. Um, so this is what most managers think performance management is about. Uh, so your task is to throw the ball and hit the paper. And I'll, I'll give you an appraisal <laughs> at the end of it. Oh. <laughs> well, you made a good effort, but you know, I think your performance was lacking in many areas. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was close. It was close. Have another go. So managers think that because they've given people, just keep going until you, until you get it, <laughs> until um, <laughs> most managers think that when they give somebody an objective at the start of the year or a goal, they think they're being really clear, they know what the target is, um, and they think they can leave that person alone to get on with it because that person knows what they're doing and you know, that's why I hired them and so on. Do you need some? Do you need some recognition for your failure? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you almost didn't fail that time. <laughs> Good work. Ugh. You're not in the t you're not in the bom bottom ten percent, are no. Okay. So, what involvement am I having to have in this process? <laughs> uh, I mean, if I wasn't picking the ball up, I could go home. <laughs> so, uh, would you just come here for me and face that way? But actually, when manager gives uh, employees objectives, the reality is more like this. So this time, you're going to throw the ball over your shoulder without looking, and I'm going to give you feedback on your performance that's going to help you to achieve the target. OK, you missed. <laughs> now, at this point, what most managers, not just managers, most people will do is they'll make a simple assumption that Joe didn't hit the target because <laughs> yeah basically and so what most managers what most people's feedback will be now will take the form of what criticism, criticism like you failed you missed what well, she knows that well actually she didn't know that but because she can't see the target but we can't do anyway um, and what will I now do what will most managers now do Right, which will do what? Know exactly what she should be doing. 
tell her what to do, exactly. So actually take away her autonomy, which is the opposite of what she needs to do in order to learn. So what most managers will do now is say, OK, you need to throw it more to your left. My left or your left? Your left. <laughs> yeah, you missed again. Uh, you, need to, you need to throw it more accurately. <laughs> That's what most managers would say, right? Go on. I don't know what you're saying, oof. A miss is a miss. <laughs> now, if we're to treat Joe as an autonomous goal-seeking system, then what we have to point out to her, the feedback we have to give her, is not what she should do, because the reality is, I don't know what she should do to hit that target, or say a target, or hit any kind of objective that she's got at work. I don't know what she should be doing. All I know is that she didn't achieve the objective. I don't know what she needs to do differently. So if I'm to treat Joe as an autonomous goal-seeking system, a servo mechanism, all I have to do is give her the deviation from target. So have another throw, and I'll give you some feedback based on the difference um, that you're going to then use to, to uh, modify your performance. OK. So what would you like to know? Can I turn around? No. <laughs> and that wouldn't help you because the ball isn't where it landed. The ball rolled. Oh. So if you turn around now, the ball is not in the same place as it was when you threw it. Oh. So turn back around. You'll have to rely on me for feedback. <laughs> uh -uh. So what would you like to know that would help you to improve your performance? Uh, is there any way I can get closer to the objective to make it um, That wouldn't help. I'm full of advice. <laughs> oh, man, I'm full of advice. Um, for, this, for the sake of expediency, I can, I can suggest that if you knew where the ball landed, you would be able to make your own adjustments. Yes, can I then go to that thing? If you want, sorry? So if I throw it, yep. can I have a look where I landed? No. You're going to have to rely on me for feedback. Oh, See, her, her innate, her natural tendency... Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, to be, it's to bend the rules, try and make the task simpler. <laughs> Which is a thinking fallacy. The task isn't any simpler just because she's closer to the paper. It doesn't get any easier. So have a throw, and I'll let you know where the ball landed. Because I'm sure that's what you're about to... OK, that was a, uh, that was a good throw. It, it, went, it went high, and it hit the ceiling. So that's okay. probably going to alter the, uh, the results. OK, what would you like to know? How close was I? Very. Can you point it out to me how close that was? There. Ooh. I don't know if you recreate it though. Ah, uh, what stops you recreating it? Because I can't see. Not well, you, you can't see anyway, but you could recreate what you're doing here. Were you paying attention to how you held your arm? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if you it. Yeah, so if you were thinking about consistency in throwing, you could start to what we call calibrate, start to adjust for the feedback. Yeah. Have a go. What would you like to know? Not very. <laughs> well, that's how I did it like that. <laughs> okay. I didn't realise this is what I was volunteering. You, you, were, <laughs> you were that side of the target. I'm leaving. You were that side of the target, about a metre and a half. Okay. Yeah, so it's quite a way out. And that was closer. You were you were short of the target, right. and to your left, oh. you were exactly the right distance, and you were just about four inches to the right of the paper. Notice what she just said. She didn't need me to tell her. She knew that because she's paying attention to how her arm feels. So she knew. 
It was uh, dead straight, perfect direction, but that was about six inches short. About a metre and a half to the left. <laughs> Are you noticing what's happening with the throws? Yeah, yeah. Perfectly in line, Ooh. about a meter and a half short. Oh. Yeah, yes. perfect. <laughs> like a joke. Well done. You can have a once. Uh, you can have a top twenty percent for that. Uh, yeah. Bonus. Um, What did you notice happening? Uh, how did you notice Joe as a, as a, as a servo mechanism, auto-correcting, integrating the feedback, making sense, trying to make sense of it, adjusting what she was doing based on the loop between her, the paper, the target, the feedback from me? You see how that was working in a, in a cycle. She but as Didn't she? Yes. Yes. And your posture has changed. <coughs> That she was quite sort of passive in the post, and she became more engaged with things about her body. More kind of upright and. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Somebody else said something over here? Did somebody else make a comment then? I missed it. No. Uh, so, yeah, she became less dependent on the feedback. She was learning, she knew. Uh, when she made a throw that she expected to be close or not. She knew that, didn't need me to tell her. So the closer she was getting to the target, the less feedback she needed. And then when she finally hit it, how did that feel? Good. Felt good. Because you were how empowered. Did, how did you deal with the fact that she was mm. seemed to be getting more frustrated? And that's when you get some of the performance issues because people are getting frustrated. Why are they frustrated? That's the key. they're trying to achieve what they see as Yep. Human instincts get there quicker. I, I often find it's because we've made people dependent on feedback. And when they can't make sense of the feedback that they're being given, that's when they get frustrated. And if I said to her, you need to throw it better, you need to throw it more straighter, and uh, stuff like that, she can't make any sense of that. It's meaningless. And so she'll get frustrated with it. And so she was frustrated when, when she said, how close was it? And I said, very. Because well, what does that mean? So uh, a... Servo mechanism will run out of control when we disconnect the feedback line. What will happen is if the aircon, um, in a certain type of, of design of a servo system, if we unplug the feedback, the thermostat, it will just be on all the time. And it will be limited by its physical output capacity, but it will be on all the time and eventually it will break. <clears throat> so if we disconnect feedback, a servo mechanism can't self-regulate. And in a human being, the inability to self-regulate means lack of control, and lack of control means frustration. So actually what we can do is, as I did with Joe, teach people how to ask for the right feedback that's going to help them to self-regulate. Because we generally don't do that. We generally teach managers how to give feedback. We, teach, we don't teach people how to ask for feedback. And therefore, if we only teach the manager how to give feedback, and we only focus on the behavior of the manager, who becomes responsible for the results? The manager. Whose fault is it when it doesn't work? The manager. If the manager's feedback is, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do more of the other, if the employee does what the manager says, and it doesn't work, well, I did what you told me. It's your fault it didn't work. The reason it didn't work is because the manager isn't in the employee's head. They cannot make those adjustments quickly enough. Only the decision maker, the person performing the task, can make the decisions. Uh, people, as a general rule, will do more of what you reward them for. And when you think about reward, you might think of things like money and things, stuff, uh, treats. Are these effective as a way of motivating people? Why not? Mm. 
when we go to a hotel and we leave a review on TripAdvisor, we don't say it was great. There were sh bed sheets and pillows and everything. <laughs> it had a door. <laughs> <coughs> but if it doesn't have those things, we write a negative review. So, uh, anybody know who this fellow is? Yeah, Frederick Hertzberg, uh, who uh, is famous for his research into extrinsic rewards. And uh, Mark Lepper in 1973 and Frederick Hertzberg in 1987 uh, really gave rise to the idea that we have motivating factors and what we call hygiene factors. Motivating factors, things like recognition, status, um, praise, self-esteem, learning, personal growth. They're the things that actually switch us on and motivate us. Hygiene factors, they're the things we expect. We get unhappy if those things are taken away, but those things don't motivate us to perform better. Um, I, 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 there was a, a company I, I used to do um, some uh, talent programs with, a big engineering company, global engineering company. They acquired another business, uh, and this business was a defense contractor and used to do a bit of nuclear power stations and stuff like that. I had 250 employees, and uh, every single project they were working on was behind schedule and over budget. So they decided they'd implement a reward system to give people an incentive to get all these projects back on track. <coughs> and they figured, um, you know, it's not just the project managers that are responsible. It's everybody in the company plays a part. You know, the receptionist plays a part, and the security guard plays a part, and the, you know, the one who works in the canteen. You know, everyone, you know, the administrators, everyone somehow adds to that result. And therefore, oh, and the managers too, of course, who came up with the idea, which was that if at the end of the year all the projects were on time and on budget, they would pay every employee a £1,000 bonus including the managers who came up with the idea, of course. Not that I'm cynical. So at the end of the year, do you think that they were, as a result of this great motivation of a £1,000 bonus, do you think that everybody had pulled their fingers out and at the end of the year all the projects were on time and on budget? Made no difference at all. Not a bean of difference. So logically that means they didn't pay them the bonus, right? Well, they did pay them the bonus on the basis that, well, people have come to expect it now. And probably the managers wanted it as well. And they couldn't justify just paying themselves. <coughs> uh, so they paid out a quarter of a million pounds and rewarded underperformance. <laughs> this is what motivates us. Can you see what it is that's motivating about that? Or, uh, sorry, not motivating, but is a reward system. Can you see the reward system that's in that photograph? It's something that we are hardwired to respond to and it develops before we're even born and a newborn baby will seek it out, will actually look for it. Do you know what it is? Uh, eye, eye contact. The simplest form of reward for us as a social species, recognition, attention, is eye contact. So looking at that, nice, right? You, you like it? A bit of eye contact, it's fun. I'll show you a similar picture, which will be even better, because it actually includes two things that we're hardwired to respond to. That one's even better, right? Did it, did it give anybody a little warm glow when that picture came? Because we are hardwired. A newborn baby will look for eyes. We're hardwired to respond to a look and a smile. Social contact, attention, interaction. This is what drives us and what rewards us as a social species because eye contact, a smile, recognition, acceptance mean for a social species survival. Rejection means being an outcast from the social group, means being uh, at the mercy of predators, means death. So we have a very, very strong instinct for social conformance. And that instinct is part of the template that's, that's part of our programming before we're even born. What does that tell you about what we might be, um, we might suggest managers do more of? <laughs> something more general than smile. We might, uh, we might suggest that managers do something else. Communicate. Interact with people. Yes. 
So here's another um, neuroscience uh, psychology theory. This one's from 1986. And it very, plays a very important part in our behavior as a social species. And at work, our social behavior drives a lot of issues that, we, that fall under the umbrella of performance management. So, in your brain, there is a physical relationship between every sensory nerve ending in your body and a map in the brain that we might call a reality map. It's a, it's a physical representation of the current state of the outside world as it is available to your senses. Your senses are not going to detect everything that's going on and, uh, and, and the, subject to, uh, the subjectivity and hence the bias that we talked about earlier. But every nerve ending, every sensory nerving, uh, nerve ending in your body ends up in an area of the brain that we might call the reality map. There's another identical map in the brain and it isn't connected to the outside world. It's connected internally. But its, it's function and its structure is identical to the reality map. And we might call this one the desire map. This is where your brain creates an expectation of how you want the world to be. And then the way that the nervous system is physically wired up is as a servo mechanism, whose job is to resolve the difference between the reality and the desire map, and that difference becomes motor output, which is behavior. Uh, 1986, it's uh, the simulation theory of mind reading. Mind reading because one of the things that comes out of this uh, theory is the idea that one of the functions of the mind is to simulate another person's mind. So you can think about a friend or a family or a partner and, and somebody said to you what do you think you'd, they'd like for their birthday and you would be able to make some suggestions that you think would be fairly accurate because you feel like you know them you're able to simulate their mind but the mind as a simulator means that we can make predictions we can make decisions we don't just react we take in sensory information and we make a decision we think we play out different scenarios in our heads we think, well, what would happen if I did this? What would they say if I said this? What would they say if I did that? And then we'll make a decision based on what we think is the outcome that's uh, you know, most favorable to us. And so the mind is a simulator both of uh, physical reality. If I walk over here, I can imagine what's going to happen. I, I think about it before I do it. You, you came here tonight, you thought about coming here, you thought about the route you might take, you thought about what the traffic might be like, you wondered what it's going to be like when you get here, you wonder what the sandwiches are going to be like, you come in through the room, you pick up a sandwich, you think, I wonder what that's going to taste like. And all of this is because you're able to predict the future. Of course, you can't really predict the future, but you think you can because your simulations seem so real because they take the, fun uh, the structure in your brain uh, of exactly the same way same structure as your brain represents reality. Um, simulation theory of mind reading and some work by a couple of, uh, a couple of guys called Galise and Goldman in 1985 uh, into mind reading in an area of the brain called your mirror neurons. Has anybody heard of these? Uh, so they're here in the front part of your brain in something called the prefrontal cortex. And what these two guys were studying was uh, monkeys, some primates in the wild who were able to see another monkey using a tool to get ants out of the tree for, to eat them. And this other monkey could copy what the first monkey was doing. Now, could you all do this? you all do that? Excellent. I didn't give you any verbal instructions. I didn't tell you what to do. But you're able to decode what you see and turn it into behavior because you have these mirror neurons and we share them with lots of other species. This is a Californian jay. So they've recently done some research with these things where the jay's behavior changed depending on whether it could see another jay or not. And through some very cleverly designed experiments, they figured out this is because the jay is imagining what the other jay is thinking and is adapting its behavior based on what it thinks that the other jay is going to do. That tells us that these things are self-aware because they know what they're going to do and they know what another bird's going to do 
And depending on whether they think another bird is going to steal their nuts or not, they either bury them or they don't. Anybody know who this is? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's all right. It's a, I didn't expect you to. Uh, this is a, um, a, a Dutch anthropologist called Franz de Waal. He's devoted his life to studying um, morality and ethics in animals. And, um, oh, Franz de Waal, morality and ethics in animals, uh, and which gives us this innate sense of fairness. Not just us, but crows, elephants, dogs, primates. They've researched this in many uh, different species now and keep finding the same results which is that based on these, uh, the function of these mirror neurons, these mirror neurons don't only allow you to do that or use a tool to get some ants out of a tree. The mirror neurons also allow you to pick up very subtle physiological changes in another person, reproduce those changes within yourself, and we call that what? Empathy. So you actually feel physically what you imagine somebody else is feeling. And what that does in a social species is it drives behaviours which are innately cooperative. Because my ability to simulate the future and think, what would this person do if I behaved like this? They'd be sad. I don't want them to feel sad because I don't like feeling sad and therefore I won't do it. I'll do something that makes them happy. Um, so, where are we? So we've got simulation of mind. So it's basically the neuroscience of empathy. And, oh, let me go back. I'm going to show you another video. This one's taken from a, a TED talk. So I strongly recommend you look on YouTube if you're interested in the subject. Um, and just Google TED Franz de Waal. You'll find this video. It's very uh, easy to find. This is just a one-minute clip from that video. What they did was they got these, uh, these monkeys called uh, capuchin monkeys and they got them to perform a task and they rewarded them for doing that task to see what would happen. The monkeys that you're going to see in this video have never done this experiment before and so this behaviour is totally innate. And uh, Franz de Waal is going to tell you some more about it. He would do, but we've got no sound now. Ah. Uh -uh. Well, I'll tell you, I, I'll describe since we've lost the sound. So the monkey on the left, the, the experiment is they give the monkey a stone, the monkey gives the stone back and they reward it with a piece of cucumber. The one on the right, they give it a stone, gives the stone back, reward it with a grape. The monkey on the left sees it being given a grape, they give it a stone, she gives the stone back, gives it a piece of cucumber. Gives the one on the right the stone, she gives the stone back, <laughs> give her a grape. The one on the left, give it a stone, so she tests the stone out, bangs it against the wall of the cage, gives the stone back, give her a piece of cucumber. So remember, these monkeys have never done this experiment before, but they're fast learners. And what you see is an automatic, instant response to that sense of inequality. Because this monkey knows it's doing the same job as this one, but it's been rewarded with cucumber instead of a grape, and it would prefer to have a grape, right? <coughs> what does that tell us about reward systems? For jobs where we can't count how many widgets somebody makes in a day. So, for the same task, we innately expect the same reward. What happens if the reward is relative to individual agreement? So what happens if we've been uh, employed on a personally, individually negotiated contract and we've negotiated whatever pay we're happy with and then we join and find out that a colleague with the same job title, doing the same job, is paid differently? How do we feel about that? Do we think, oh, well, I should have asked for more money when I, you know, when I was negotiating? Do we think that? Yeah. We think, well, why, you know, they should have told me. We think we feel an innate sense of unfairness, of injustice. And it's not just humans. It's monkeys, crows, dogs, elephants. Um, 
some of the experiments that they've, that they've done that you can find more, more videos of. Um, cooperation between apes. They go back to the 1960s. They're incredible. The problem with rewarding inequally or rewarding in any way based on some arbitrary definition of job performance is it's innately subject to bias because we are biased. What does it tell us about the gender pay gap? We saw how instantly that monkey responded to that unequal pay. How do we handle that differently as humans? Do we instantly throw our staplers and pocket calculators at our bosses and storm out? Or do we sit there and start to justify it? And what do we do? How do we, has anybody been in that situation? How do, you, how do you cope with it? How do you manage it? Walk with your feet and go somewhere else. You, you can do, yeah. What about motivation? Performance management, we want to motivate people, right? Motivation's good. Anybody here feeling motivated right now? Did anybody make any New Year's resolutions like this? And, and how are you getting on with that? <laughs> We're able, through this physical structure of the reality map and the desire map, to hold, in a way, to hold two competing realities at the same time. If we are able to act, if we have control, if we have autonomy, then the way that we resolve this difference between these two maps is to take action, to do something like we saw Jo do. She, she modified her behavior, she took action, she was able to figure things out for herself, she did something, she hit the target. If we continue to do that, she would get better and better and better, and after a few more minutes, she'd be hitting the target every time. We don't always have the capacity to act. We're not always given the scope of authority to act. So what happens if there's a difference between the reality map, how things are right now, and the desire of how I would like things to be, or the objective that I've been set as part of my job? What do we do if we can't act in order to resolve those differences? What do we do then? We could give up. Yeah, Would it, we could experience that thing that somebody mentioned earlier. So, frustration. Sorry, what? I'm just saying you give up, you just accept the reality. You, you just accept it, you'd give up. You'd become resigned. You'd become, in the case of performance management, we would call that, or HR world, disengaged. We'd give up. We'd think, what's the point? Wouldn't even try. We'd look at that and we'd laugh. When I, um, uh, my, my last employer was, was British Telecom. And um, I actually had a, a, a sales job, believe it or not. It was something called solution sales, selling outsourcing and managed services and stuff. And the year that I left, I took a voluntary redundancy package. They put my sales target up from three million pounds a year. Uh, they had this big sales launch and some big thing and show at some theatre in London. And in the break, they put envelopes out with people's names on. It was all a big game, basically. Um, and you took your envelope and that told you what your sales target was for next year. So mine went from 3 million to 46 million. I laughed and thought, I'll just take voluntary redundancy uh, when I can. So I took voluntary redundancy at the next, uh, the next opportunity, which was the June. Uh, so we'll give up. We'll just think, well, what's the point? And actually, research around coaching and goal setting and so on tells us that getting people to set exciting, big, audacious, sparkly, glittery, bright, shiny goals is actually counterproductive, two reasons. Firstly, it's so far away from reality that the person becomes disengaged because they believe it's just not possible or it's going to be too much uh, effort. Secondly, like you saw with the feedback uh, exercise with Joe, they're not able to calculate the steps to get from where they are to that big goal, and so they end up not getting there. So actually setting big challenging goals is actually counterproductive. What happens is it creates conflict and stress. Now as human beings, uh, any goal-oriented creature actually that's, that's working as a servo mechanism, actually any servo mechanism is inherently in a state of conflict, always, it's never at rest. Imagine you go on some spiritual retreat and you hike up to the top of some hill and there's a 
Big brook, a little waterfall and some birds singing and the air's fresh and there's mountains and you think this is so wonderful, it's so peaceful, it's the most wonderful place, I'm so finally at peace and at rest and I can just sit and you sit there for five seconds and then you think, fancy an ice cream. <laughs> We're constantly at, in a state of imbalance between how things are and how we would like them to be. If we're able to act, we can resolve those differences. We can resolve the differences between us. But if we can't act, it becomes internalized as conflict and stress. So the more we take away autonomy from people, the more we take away control and just tell them what to do, the more we create conflict and stress because the desire, the output, the objective is unachievable simply by virtue of the fact that we're telling them how to do it. The other way that we resolve this conflict, of course, is that we lie to ourselves. <laughs> Can anybody spot the inherent lie in all of these statements? In the Who said that? In the future, yeah, what about the first bit? I, yeah, so I will. I am. So we've got present tense followed by future tense in the same statement. What that tells us is I'm currently thinking about <laughs> something that I fully intend to do, even though in my heart I know I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and so we resolve the conflict by lying to ourselves. Yeah, I'm going to smash my target this year. Yeah, I'm going to get promoted. I'm, it's not under your control. But we act as it, is, as it is. I guess The Apprentice must be coming up soon on TV. <laughs> Anybody like to watch The Apprentice when it's on? And you'll see all these bright young things go, oh, I'm going to smash it, I'm going to do this, I'm, gonna do I'm the best salesman, I'm going I'm to make you a million pounds. And, you know, nobody can predict the future, but we think we can. Motivation creates conflict because motivation, the act of getting fired up, thinking about what I'm going to do, but I'm not currently doing it and I have no capacity to currently do it, creates conflict, creates stress. So this might well be what you would like. But if the reality looks like that, <laughs> we often resolve that inherent conflict by lying, by saying, yeah, I'm just going to, oh, I've had a hard day at work, and I just had this thing, and I went to this evening CIP, and I'm just going to have a rest for tonight, but I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to put my bag by the door, <laughs> I'll put my gym bag by the door, to remi and I, not to remind me, because obviously I, I'm, I'm going to do it. But I'll go tomorrow. And then I, well, I had a long. I had to start to work early, and I just get in the morning. It's busy anyway. I'll go in the evening. And so we keep on perpetuating the lie, because it's a way of resolving the inherent conflict caused by motivation. Motivation is the absence of action. So we shouldn't measure people or reward people for being motivated for what they say they're going to do, but reward them for what they actually do do. All too often, when we give people goals and give them objectives, we use SMART, we say your sales target's a million pounds, um, we want to complete a report by Friday, present a monthly update to the board. Do these seem okay as objectives? Do they seem typical of the sort of objectives that you might give somebody uh, annually? What's wrong with them? Why are they counterproductive when we think of the, the, the human servo mechanism? It's in the future. Yes, so it's in the future. It's still a, a guess, a prediction about the future, yes. Anything else? Yes, good. So it's not what they don't want it. It doesn't do them anything. They'll get paid a bonus or they'll get a job for doing it, but it's not something that they intrinsically want for themselves. They're doing it for you in consideration of some payment, some job security, whatever it might be. From the point of view of thinking of us uh, as, a, as a servo mechanism, the fundamental problem with these objectives is that they are solutions. Sales target of a million pounds is a solution that somebody else decided would be a good way to solve a problem. So the problem underlying that might be, uh, as a business, we need to generate a certain amount of revenue to pay for the offices and the people and R&D and keep the business uh, functioning and so on and make a profit and all that. 
Um, and so we'll figure out the way to do that is we'll hire a bunch of people, uh, salespeople and we'll give them a target of a million pounds. But a million pounds sales <laughs> order value is not actually what we want. What we really want is a certain amount of revenue, but we're making assumptions about things like margin and cost of sale and so on, cost of running the business and all these things. So what we do is we, take a, we hire somebody as a salesperson and we say, this is your sales target, that's your goal, that's your objective. But it doesn't really mean anything to their brain. We can't put that on the desire map because it's not expressed in sensory terms. We have no primary sense for, for, for detecting the presence of money. We have no primary sense of, of Excel spreadsheets. But we have primary senses of sight and touch and temperature and balance and all these other things. So the desire map is, is a sensory map. These are abstract. They don't mean anything. And the simplest way that I would suggest to you as a, as a practical way of how do we get these objectives both aligned with the individual and how do we give them in to the individual in a way that they can put it onto their desire map so they can actually become autonomous, self-regulating, self-correcting to achieve that goal is instead of giving them objectives to achieve, give them problems to solve. Because remember, the objective is a solution, as it's phrased there. <coughs> Instead of giving people a solution, we give them the problem, and we let them figure it out. The, prob the, s the problem is, you threw the ball, and it landed this far away from the paper. So it's up to Joe to figure out what to do about it. Let them figure out the solution. Don't reward success. Reward learning and autonomy. Seems paradoxical, because we're so, in many organizations, we're so wired up, we're so used to rewarding people for hitting objectives, what we can actually do is reward them for figuring out how to hit objectives. So simple performance management rules that I'll leave you with are <coughs> express objectives as problems, not solutions. That allows people to create the desire map for themselves and they then become self-correcting, self-regulating, autonomous, in control, engaged in order to get there. We give them simple, fast feedback. Eye contact, thank you, will motivate and reward and engage people more than a year's supply of cupcakes or uh, cinema tickets or whatever else you, you give people. We don't need to give complicated, detailed feedback, just warmer or colder because the servo mechanism will automatically integrate and correct we just relate the difference, where they are versus where they're meant to be. And we make the reward system fair. This is very important, because you saw how the monkeys reacted to the unfair reward system. There is a catch. Um, reward decisions that drive behaviors instead of results. Weird, paradoxical. We don't reward hitting the result. We reward the behaviors that got the results because the behaviors will get the results again and again and again and again. So the catch is this. In order to give simple, fast feedback, what does the manager have to do? <laughs> yeah, pay attention. We worry about employee engagement. That is not the problem. The problem is manager engagement because the manager is an intrinsic part of that feedback loop. The system can't function without feedback. Anybody got any questions? Yes? Yes. Um, I'll give you an example from yesterday. So I was doing uh, uh, some, um, some training and some team building uh, with, a, with a company yesterday. And um, so the manager said, well, we need to get, to get somebody to pull off an attendance report. And what happens is they ask somebody to do it, and they say, yeah, all right. And they kind of put it on their to-do list, but they're not really motivated because they don't want the attendance report. They're doing it because they feel obliged to do it. 
So it becomes a low priority. The end of the day comes. They haven't done it. So telling the person what to do is giving a solution. What's the problem? Why does the manager need an attendance report? Because they've got a problem and they think that information will help them to solve it. So what they do is they say to that person, I've got a problem, which is figuring out who's here, who isn't, they're running uh, courses. Um, so we've got a problem figuring out who's on courses, which ones are under, uh, which ones have worse attendance than others. We don't know where to focus. And that person then says, oh, I could run an attendance report. Great. So they've solved the problem. So if we've got um, uh, one of the smart targets, so the, the objectives was uh, give a salesperson a million pound uh, sales target. That's a solution to a problem. But what's the real problem behind that? What is it the business actually wants or the managers of the business actually want? They don't really want sales of a million pounds. What they really want is something else. Anybody make a suggestion? Growth, new business, or investment in product development, or uh, increasing staff, or moving to a new office. There's something that they want to do with the business, and they think the way to do that is by, by giving salespeople targets. So if instead we tell the salespeople, we need to generate this much income from the business, salespeople, because they've been salespeople all their lives, that's the template, that's what they expect to do, that's the scope, that's their focus, will assume their job is to sell because that's what we're hiring them for. So it takes a bit of change to get there, but one of the things that we can do to, to, to do that, to make that happen, is by giving the salespeople more awareness of what the problem is that they're trying to solve. Because, for example, instead of selling anything at a million pounds um, sales order value, the first thing the salespeople will do is get that by the shortest route they can. So they'll sell a million pounds, but the margin will be non-existent. We didn't make any money out of it. That was a waste of time. So the next year, the company will say, right, next year we're going to change the targets. This year you've got to do a million pounds of sales order value, but at a, maximum, uh, a minimum uh, margin of 25%. Now they'll do it, but they'll do something else. They'll sell only one product that's got a high margin on it. Ah, that's not what we wanted them to do. Right, this year you've got to do a million pounds, minimum margin 25%, and you've got to sell... 10% uh, of this product and 12% of this product and 25% of this product and 40% of this product and we must make it com more and more and more complicated every year. D d do any of you work in companies that have done this with sales targets? Uh, when I worked for BT, they launched the sales target in April. They finalized it in the June after the year had closed. So they told us what we were going to get paid for three months after the end of the year in which we were supposed to do it. That clearly can't influence our behaviour. So if the salespeople are aware of what the objective is, we've got to deliver this amount of money, then they will figure out ways to do that that you haven't thought of. So often it's just letting people in on the secret of why we're setting that objective. It's not complicated. You probably think, think it's a bit scary to say to the salespeople, uh, we need to keep the business running by having this amount of income. Can you figure out how to do that? One of the things they might come up with is ways to reduce costs that we haven't thought of. But actually, it achieves the same objective. Any other questions? Uh, you spoke about earlier about, about teaching or training managers to give feedback Well, even more than training them, making it their responsibility. See, if you, own, if you own a task and it's something you've thought of for yourself, um, it's something that you want for yourself, you will figure out how to ask for, am I there yet? You will know how to do that. You'll, uh, whatever it is, you know, it's something you want to do at home, a hobby you want to take up. Let's say you want to take up a new hobby like uh, woodwork or stained glass making. You'll go to classes, you'll go to the tutor and you'll say, what about this? Am I, am I on the right lines? What, what do I need to do here? And I, feel, I keep doing this, but I feel it's not right. What do I do about it? So people, when they own the objective, automatically know how to ask for feedback. But we train that out of them. We train them to sit there and do what you're told. And your manager will tell you what to do paradoxically that creates a lot more work for the manager because now the managers having to figure out what to do and solve people's problems for them taking away autonomy creating the problem of disengagement that then we're trying to solve 
in other ways, in other roundabout ways. So I'm not suggesting we train people how to ask for feedback, but we make them, by holding them accountable for the end result and giving them the control of the means to achieve that result, and sometimes the manager can help them by, look, you're getting frustrated with this, but you haven't asked me for this feedback yet. Um, often we associate feedback with criticism. And we don't want, you know, we want to be perfect. We want to be good. We want to be good at what we do. So we don't want to ask for feedback because there's connotations of criticism with it. That's a hurdle to get over with managers, how to give feedback in a way that's supportive. Positive and negative feedback doesn't mean good and bad. Positive simply means do more of. Negative means do less of. It's not good or bad. I'm not judging the air conditioning system. I just know I need to turn the temperature up or down. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. In my personal experience, yeah. interestingly, I'm not seeing it so much in organisations, but in individuals, where individuals are saying, I want more from my career, I want to do this, I want to achieve that, what do I need to do? And starting to push back on their managers to say, give me feedback on this, here's what I'm doing, watch me while I do it and give me some feedback on it. Um, so I'm seeing individuals asking their managers to be more engaged. Don't give me some feedback on something that you didn't even see me doing, based on you know, second-hand reports. If you want to see my presentation skills, come and sit in my presentation and then tell me. Um, so it's interesting, I'm seeing quite a bit of pushback at the moment from individuals uh, through coaching talent, uh, talent management programs and so on. Is that coming from like, younger or older? What's the, what's the uh, yeah, younger or older. I would say probably people in their 30s and 40s. Old enough to have some experience that actually there's more to life and I can achieve more and I can get more of what I want and you know, help my organisation get what they want as well. And not old enough yet to be totally, uh, what's the word? Institutionalised. So I think, uh, I think that's the time. I think the important questions, just two important questions I'll leave you with. How will you get there? So we give somebody a challenge, a problem, we let them figure out how will you get there. And in terms of the feedback mechanism, are we there yet? Simple. We can achieve everything we want with two questions, but we've got to be paying attention. That's the catch. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Rachel.